Alex here with part 199 of the My Docket series on child custody and visitation. As in my previous videos, I'll take this opportunity to direct my viewers to part zero if you haven't seen it yet. That's the video that contains the detailed disclaimers and the underlying purpose of the series. Two things that I will glaze over are, number one, I'm not in the middle of this right now. My case is completely and totally over. It's closed. It cannot be reopened. And that's because my excess parental rights have been terminated. Number two, the nutshell version as to the purpose of the series is to give my viewers one big example of my eight year long high conflict child custody ordeal from beginning to end in chronological order. We go into my motion to modify legal custody. I mentioned to you guys that this was coming after the judge granted my motion for leave to set the vision appointment, but ordered that I would have to drive or fly 300 miles to another city to set the appointment in that city. So in response, I obviously did not do what the judge said and instead filed a motion to modify legal custody, which would thus obviate the need for all of this nonsense. This is one of those motions that is granted summarily, so I am grateful for that. We'll talk about that when it happens though. Um, mindset going into this was very annoyed. I didn't feel like I wanted to file this. I felt like judges and lawyers didn't like proper person litigants who filed a lot of papers, even though they were the ones that actually caused proper person litigants, at least in this case, to file a lot of papers. And being pushed into doing what I already know they don't like annoys me because it just kind of shoves me into that frame of the proper person litigant that files too many papers. In any event, that was my mindset at the time. I was pleasantly surprised to see that this would be granted summarily. And so my mindset at that time when the order granting came down was a whole lot better. That all being said, I think we really need to go straight into what I have filed. Here we have the motion to modify legal custody and visitation. Standard introductory paragraph indicating this was filed by me. I am appearing in proper person, which means I don't have an attorney, and I am requesting this court modify legal custody and visitation. Summary. I, the natural father, and my ex, the natural mother, share a common minor child of age nine. I have primary physical custody with visitation rights to my ex. We share joint legal custody, and my ex resides in Reno. I reside in Henderson. I should be awarded sole legal custody. On November 9th, I asked my ex if she was going to schedule the vision appointment. She failed to reply. At this juncture, it was her sole responsibility to do so. Um, I am citing the court's order after that June 29 hearing, which states as such. And you guys remember, you saw that hearing where she was like, hey, but he said I can do this. And the judge is like, okay, I'll go ahead and put that into the order. And then she doesn't do it. Because it's all about getting it in the order. It's all about getting the label. It's not about actually doing what the child needs with a high conflict ex. The conflict is the point. Going into the next assertion, February 2nd, 2016, I filed a motion seeking leave of the court to set vision appointment. On March 10th, the court recognized my ex failed to meet the child's needs and gave me the authority to set and attend vision appointments. However, noted that because we continue to enjoy legal custody, that we can't that I can't change the vision provider without consulting with my ex and reaching an agreement, which is inane. She doesn't have to say this. I feel like she just wanted to punish me for winning. There is nothing in the law that says the judge had to do this. Nothing. She could have, at that time, resolved this issue. They talk about this in the in the uh, case Bluestein v. Bluestein in Nevada Supreme Court. Um, they published a case called Bluestein where they explain that once a motion to modify legal custody was filed, the court was within its discretion to do whatever it took to meet the child's best needs. So she invented this restriction out of thin air. It was, in my opinion, just to spite me. So. You can see here that I'm bringing up the, court, the court's own inane order as a basis for why I'm filing this second motion. It's sometimes you have to do this. I talked about it with motions for order to show cause. Oftentimes with the courts and how they exercise discretion, they deny motions for order to show cause. And I'm, I've said before, one of the best things you can do is continue to shove in their face each time they denied a motion because then it reaches a point where the judge is like, dang, this is the fourth time they filed something and it's still happening. Maybe we should actually look into it. So same thing here. I'm taking the court's own order and I'm using the court's own order against it as a justification for why I'm filing yet another motion. If you want to know why um, I have to, I bring this up as yet another motion, filing too many papers and, and all of that, please watch my video on the topic. End of filings is not end of abuse. I talk about the court's wrongheaded approach to proper person litigants filing too many papers. 
um, in that video. Again, it's titled End of Filings is Not End of Abuse. Going into the next assertion, March 11th, I proposed changing the child's dental and vision providers. My ex failed to respond to or even read this message. To date, the child is overdue for his vision examination. Once again, take a look at the declaration of Dr. Terrence Cochran. My ex has not logged into Our Family Wizard or otherwise communicated to me on any issue. See also Exhibits 1 and 2. We'll take a look at the exhibits later. Legal analysis. This is one of my favorite cases because this case nails the judges to the wall on legal custody. Judges hate modifying legal custody, but according to this case, they have no choice but to do so. The reason why is that the Supreme Court has held under these cases, more specifically, we would go down into the next case below, which is Rivero v. Rivero. They have stated, and I'll read it verbatim, legal custody involves having basic legal responsibility for a child and making ma major decisions regarding the child, including the child's health, education, and religious upbringing. So legal custody vests this right with one parent, while joint legal custody vests this right with both parents. Joint legal custody requires that the parents be able to communicate, cooperate, and compromise to act in the best interest of the child. In a joint legal custody situation, the parents must consult with each other to make major decisions regarding the child's upbringing while the parent with whom the child is residing at the time usually makes the minor day-to-day -day decisions and that's the whole physical custody approach there this is not just rights people think that legal custody is about your right it's my right 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 i'm the parent it's my right no it also carries with it responsibilities you get legal custody you get the rights and the responsibilities that go with it. This is one of the things that I think a lot of the judges don't think through. If you cannot exercise your legal legal custody responsibilities and obligations, then you are not entitled to your legal custody rights. I will say it again. If you cannot satisfy your legal custody obligations and responsibilities, you do not get those rights. The reason that I cited this case was because I was preparing to file an appeal. I figured she was going to just deny it. I was really surprised that she would have granted it. And it might have been because she saw me cite the case. This whole, this motion was ramping up for an appeal because I just knew how many parents had tried to modify legal custody and failed because the parents need to cooperate. Okay, well, that's what they need to do. That's not what's actually occurring in the case. Just because the courts want somebody to do something so badly doesn't mean that that's actually going to occur. If you can't tell, there's a lot of frustration for me at this point in the process because I'm very frustrated that it took the court this many years to figure out something so basic. And the only reason the judge figured it out was because I filed a motion and I forced her to do what she was supposed to do from the beginning. So the court has recognized that my ex's inability to constructively communicate has resulted in the child's pain and suffering in the past. I cite the court's own words against it. Um, about what she, the, the court stated with regards to our ability to communicate and the child's suffering with regards to the dental neglect. And then I go into the request for sole legal custody. I'm also trying to alter my ex's visitation. I'm trying to say it should be supervised. On February 10th, 2016, the child reported to um, our son's psychologist that she struck him in the face so hard he was bleeding. On February 17th, 2016, the child elaborated to the psychologist the circumstances regarding the time my ex pretty much beat him. On February 24th, Dr. Brian Norensberg notified me that he had filed a report with CPS of Clark County. Spoiler alert, CPS didn't do anything. On the basis that it was his professional opinion that my ex had repeatedly struck the child, that the blows constituted repeated physical abuse, and that the child was suffering traumatic amnesia. Dr. Brian Norensberg urged me that my ex should not be permitted to have unsupervised visitation with the child. On March 17th, I notified my ex of Dr. Brian Norensberg's findings. She didn't even reply. Legal analysis in Nevada, as in other states, the best interest of the child is paramount concern. This is St. Mary v. Damon. This includes physical, mental, de developmental, and emotional needs. And then we go into this other statute here, which discusses abuse or neglect of a child, which includes, quote, physical or mental injury of a non-accidental nature, unquote. And another statute supports that. The doctor is a licensed psychologist and an expert on foster children, child abuse, and neglect, and children who have suffered traumatic events. His testimony would be instrumental in satisfying the court as to the extent and frequency of the physical abuse. On November 4th, 2014, the court heard allegations asserting that my ex had repeatedly struck the child in the hands with a wooden spoon as a form of discipline. These new allegations, however, concern blows to the child's face that are so hard that they cause him to bleed. 
Going into case Castle v. Simmons, this is a case that defeats res judicata barriers when it comes to domestic violence. Actually, you could probably apply it to anything. But in this specific case, the context was domestic violence. In the courts, in this particular case, were throwing out allegations just because there were previous allegations of domestic violence. The Supreme Court of Nevada was not amused by that argument, overturned the decision, and sent it back, stating that sometimes parents aren't aware of the extent of the domestic violence at the time that they brought it to the court's attention. This is one of those examples. She was beating him with a wooden spoon then, she's punching him in the face now. So I'm using Castle v. Simmons to basically force, like I mentioned, this judge to do what she needs to do, because my concern is that she's going to raise res judicata principles to throw my motion out. Most of the time, the judges are going to try to find some basis to throw your case out. So you have to armor yourself against this tactic by citing statutes, rules, and case law, and preparing the briefs for an appeal. Take it from me, I've won four appeals. It happens all the time. Mediation. Here we have my usual mediation um, boilerplate, which states, please don't send us to mediation. It's a waste of time. This is the same exact paragraph that I use verbatim. I've been using it ever since the third mediation. Thankfully, the court obliges this particular section and does not send me to mediation again. If you want to know why mediation is futile in certain cases, especially high conflict child custody cases, watch my video on the topic mediation and settlement. If you want to know why your judge in particular may not really believe that this is a thing, watch my video on the topic high conflict incompetence. Going into the next section, hearing. In accordance with WDFCR 44 subsection 4B, I have filed a notice to set together with this motion. Um, by the way, guys, this is an interesting thing here. So the, the local rules, specifically 44 subsection 4B, require, it's not optional, they require you to file a notice to set together with a motion to modify custody. It's mandatory. When I did this, I've done it a bunch of times in the past with Judge Weller. He followed the rules, no problem with him. But I do this with Judge Robb and her clerk says, you don't get to choose when we set a hearing. That's up to the judge. So I'm just like, okay, it wasn't me choosing. It was WDFCR 44 sub 4B. I didn't say that to the clerk. I'm not gonna fight with the clerk on the issue, but I am gonna use that as ammunition to appeal. Luckily for the judge and the clerk, the judge granted my motion summarily. And I say luckily because guess what? She did this to somebody else after me. And that person that she did this to after me filed a notice of appeal and the decision was overturned by the Court of Appeals and guess what they cited? WDFCR 44 sub B, 4B. So just because a judge has it in their head that they don't like a certain thing doesn't mean that the judge gets to just do whatever she wants. The rules, the statutes, and the case law serve as the shackles that bind them down. They are supposed to comply with statutes, rules, and case law. If somebody is especially interested in this case, the one that I'm talking about, please let me know and I'll track it down. Post it down in the comments below and I'll find the case. But actually, you probably don't even need me to put it in the comments below. All you have to do is go into Judge Bridget Robb's judicial profile on arnavadajudges.com and scroll through the red reverse decisions and you'll find it. You'll find the case where she finally, this one finally nips her. Um, anyway, this was one of those things that I was really annoyed with because sometimes it's not even just the judge that's a problem. Sometimes the clerks have this attitude and it's just like, okay. Going into the next section here, if my ex does not file an opposition, I request the court for both myself and the Dr. Brian Nornsberg to appear telephonically, requiring personal appearances on an uncontested motion would unduly burden me. My ex has recently failed to appear at debtor's exam. She's unsuccessfully concealed herself from the district attorney's process servers and FB 160031. And if she does file an opposition, then I'll make arrangements to appear personally and for my um, therapist to appear through simultaneous audiovisual equipment. SCR part 9B subsection B. Conclusion. The requests are clear here that I'm wanting sole legal custody and that I'm wanting my ex's visitation to be supervised. Verification. Here I am stating the under penalty of perjury that all of the facts alleged in this document are true and correct. Rule 5 certificate of service. Here I am indicating that this document was mailed to my ex. Uh, motion opposition notice. According to these marks, I do not have to pay. Wait a minute. I'm out of okay, so this would I would have had to pay. So most likely not most likely, for sure I had to pay a $25 filing fee with this motion since I'm trying to modify the order, the uh, the final order in the case. A list of exhibits, we have exhibit one, two, and three. Our family wizard looks like three things. Exhibit one, changing vision and dental providers. The judge directed me to set a vision appointment from now on. I'd like to change the vision provider to Dr. Paul Johnson of Henderson since I can't feasibly drive our son to Reno just to have his vision appointments there. Um, this is pretty obvious stuff and I'd like to change his dental provider. Exhibit two, and this is the report, I guess, of the last time she logged in. So it looks like she logged in back in 2015. 
and then we've got exhibit three and this is over the past okay so this is the physical um physical abuse allegations and i'm going over the physical abuse allegations described by dr brian nornsberg in that um I mean, I don't know what to tell you guys. Learning about this is pretty horrifying. In any event, she didn't respond to it. And in any event, the motion is granted. Going into the next document, notice of entry of order. If you want to learn more about the notice of entry of order, please watch my video on the topic, notice of entry of order. Most of it ties into the timelines for filing an appeal. Rule 5 certificate of service indicating this notice was sent to my ex. And that's it for that document. Next, we have the notice to set. Here, the notice to set is citing rule 44 sub 4B and um, that my ex is invited to appear at a setting. Um, you guys have gone through these before quite a few times in this case. If you wanna learn more about the notice to set, watch my video on the topic, notice to set. Oh, look at that down in the footnotes, WDFCR 44 sub 4B, verbatim, contested motions affecting child custody, including temporary custody, modification of a custody and or request to move at a state with children shall, shall, be set for a hearing at the time of filing any motion affecting custody. The party filing it shall set it simultaneously. What do you do? They don't even follow their own rules. Going on to the next page. Rule 5, Certificate of Service, indicating that under penalty of perjury that I am serving this document upon my ex. Next we have the request for submission. Um, Okay, so this is me submitting to the court for consideration the motion, the motion to modify legal custody and visitation and indicating that my ex failed to file a response to that motion. If you wanted to learn more about the request for submission, watch my video on the topic, request for submission. This is used in very few jurisdictions in Nevada and probably other states don't even use it at all. So please watch that video. Next, we have the Rule 5 Certificate of Service indicating this document was also mailed to my ex. Going into the aftermath, I filed four documents and looks like I only had to pay a filing fee on one of those documents, so I had to pay $25 in costs. My ex didn't file anything, so she incurred $0 in costs. I didn't have an attorney, so I incurred $0 in attorney fees. My ex didn't have an attorney, so she incurred $0 in attorney fees as well. As of my previous videos, if you have any questions, feel free to post, uh, feel free to post them down in the comments below, and I will see you guys next time.